Hi everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor asserts that President Biden appears confused a recurring issue McGregor highlights that historically, President Eisenhower believed countries like those in the Baltic states and Poland should remain neutral, and he made no commitments regarding Eastern Europe. According to McGregor, the NATO treaty does not mandate any actions in Ukraine, nor should it. He argues that Biden's obligation is moral, ending the war in Ukraine. Yet he seems to be unaware that the conflict has been lost for months. The Russians are steadily advancing, inching closer to the river and likely preparing to cross and address Odessa, potentially moving towards Kiev if necessary. The idea that this can be stopped is deemed absurd. A resolution could have been reached back in March or April, but efforts were made to prolong and worsen the situation. He characterizes Zelensky as the architect of Ukraine's war and destruction, noting that Zelensky, originally from the East and a Russian speaker, was a puppet installed by oligarch Kolomoisky with support from figures like Nolan. He also criticizes the globalist elites in Western Europe and the US, stating that leaders like Macron and Schultz are in a precarious position with their power at risk. They are attempting to maintain their positions by fabricating a threat and portraying themselves as saviors. A strategy that is failing the French military, along with other European forces, is unprepared for involvement in Ukraine, and any suggestions otherwise are seen as unrealistic. This rhetoric is viewed as a desperate attempt to create an illusion of strength to retain power, which is unlikely to succeed. The situation is worsened by not just provoking an unnecessary war, but by attempting to bluff through it. The West is currently facing a shortage of ammunition, equipment and trained troops with no appetite for continued conflict. European populations are gradually realizing that Russia poses no significant threat. This situation is seen as an illusion. Regarding Odessa, it was clear from the start of the crisis that the Russians would target areas historically Russian and with Russian speakers Odessa like Crimea and the eastern Donbass region, has always been predominantly Russian speaking. The Russian leadership has stated that once the conflict is over, cities like Odessa and Kerch will return to Russian control. Any attempt to intervene by crossing borders from Moldavia, Romania or Poland to prevent the Russian takeover of Odessa would lead to war with Russia, which has made it clear it will not tolerate a NATO presence in western Ukraine. If such an intervention occurs, it would result in conflict with Russia, which is prepared for this scenario. Moscow's general staff is already considering mobilizing an additional 800,000 troops for a wider war, if necessary. While Moscow does not seek this escalation and Putin has been trying to end the conflict from the beginning, the reality of losing is not acknowledged by the West. Historically, the Norwegians were better prepared for the German attack in 1940 than they are now for potential Russian threat, which would be far more severe. It is tragic to see individuals in uniform pretending to be serious combat soldiers, as they would face dire consequences in a real conflict. There is a need for Norway and other European nations to wake up to reality. The best way to avoid war with Russia is to negotiate with them now and stop making threats. Current actions, including NATO's plans to station forces and missiles near the Arctic Circle, only serve to escalate tensions and create a greater perceived threat than actually exists. This behavior, while impressive on television, does not reflect the reality of European preparedness, which is inadequate. Immediate steps are needed to address and de-escalate the situation. If confronted by the Russians, whether in western Ukraine or northern Norway, the situation would be disastrous. The choices would be between admitting defeat and executing a humiliating withdrawal, which seems inevitable, or resorting to nuclear weapons to cover up our ground weakness. Historically, the concept of flexible response was intended to avoid such a scenario by maintaining sufficient conventional military strength to deter the Soviets, ensuring that any attack would fail. The current approach, which involves threatening Russia with multiple attacks, does not foster peace, but rather escalates the potential for conflict. 
at a 2019 National Interest Dinner attended by several neoconservatives with a strong anti-Russian stance, a discussion took place with a representative from the Atlantic Council. He was warned that pushing the issue in eastern Ukraine could lead to war, but dismissed the concern, claiming that no war would occur and that Russia wouldn't escalate the situation. This reflects a fundamental misjudgment and miscalculation of Moscow's intentions from the outset. It's crucial to take Moscow's warning seriously, as they have clearly stated that involvement in western Ukraine could escalate to a global nuclear conflict. Avoiding such a scenario is essential. No sensible leader, including any US president in the past 80 years, would entertain such a dangerous proposition. He is voicing a viewpoint shared by many of his colleagues inside the Beltway, who have grown wealthy from advocating for war with Iran. Mr. Bolton, for instance, became the national security advisor under President Reagan due to the influence of Sheldon Adelson, a strong proponent of war with Iran. Similar sentiments were echoed by figures like Senator McCain, who reportedly hoped for conflict with Iran. This narrative has persisted despite the reality that Iran is not behind all regional conflicts. Many dangerous forces, such as ISIS, have been opposed to Iran and Shiite interests in Iraq and Syria. This long-standing problem persists largely due to well-funded lobbying efforts that drive war agendas. Mr. Bolton and others have profited from such lobbying, which influences Congress and the White House. President Biden has repeatedly stated that he will not cut off support to Israel, maintaining the status quo in Gaza and perpetuating the conflict. The assertion from Bolton and others is not new, but misleading. There are many other factors at play, and the focus should be on achieving stability and prosperity through peace rather than escalating war. After Ramadan, there is a risk of new coalitions forming and further actions being taken, which could be avoided if efforts were directed toward peace rather than conflict. He sees only one viable option at this point. Escalation. Israel, under his leadership, has engaged in regional confrontations and while focusing on Arabs, Palestine, and Gaza, it is likely to extend its actions into Lebanon and beyond. He believes that the perception of the US as a compliant ally, ready to provide unconditional support, encourages further escalation. Once Ramadan ends, or possibly even sooner, the entire region might face significant turmoil, potentially leading to a broader conflict that could be difficult to contain. Reflecting on past events, he recalls that when President Trump was prepared to sign a denuclearization agreement with Kim Jong-un in Hanoi, the deal was undermined by Bolton and Pompeo, both committed neoconservatives who favored confrontation. Trump's retreat from the agreement, despite strong support from Beijing, particularly given China's apprehension about North Korea, was a missed opportunity. Historically, Moscow has supported North Korea, and in response to the prolonged Ukraine conflict, Moscow has provided North Korea with advanced technology to counterbalance Western actions in Europe. This escalating situation is part of a broader pattern of US interventions, including military advisors stationed on islands close to China, such as Kuimoi and Matsu, complicating relations with China. The ongoing approach of bullying, bombing, and sanctioning countries into compliance has failed in Vietnam and the Middle East and is unlikely to succeed in Korea. There is a risk that South Korea might independently seek to distance itself from US influence, potentially with Chinese support and possibly even Japanese backing, which underscores the counterintuitive nature of current policies. Instead of demonstrating a reluctance for conflict, the current approach seems to invite it, suggesting a desire for war rather than a genuine effort to avoid one. The notion of appeasement is misunderstood. If a country cannot fight due to internal disarray, economic weakness, and fiscal crises, it is not in a position to engage in conflict. War should be pursued only when a nation is well prepared and has a strong chance of success, which is not the case currently. Since the mid to late 1990s, there has been a need for a robust military force of about 600,000 to sustain global operations. 
However, there has been a persistent reluctance to acknowledge this need, leading to a reliance on advanced technology and equipment as substitutes for reduced manpower. This has resulted in a weakened military force lacking the depth and fighting power, logistics, and sustainment if engaged in conflicts in the Middle East or Eastern Europe, the military would likely be overwhelmed quickly, potentially within 30 to 60 days. While not advocating for a draft, it is suggested that maintaining a larger and more capable army is essential. However, current policies divert resources from the military and discourage talented individuals from joining, further undermining its effectiveness. Part of the issue is the loss of talent. Individuals who might otherwise serve for many years leave as soon as possible.